Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Rocket Dollar webinar um, as part of our education series. Um, if you're coming into this for the first time, um, you might not know me. I'm Brendan Walsh. I do our business operations here. You might have heard me on the sales phone if you've ever called into Rocket Dollar. Um, but why do we do these? Um, you know, Rocket Dollar does not really provide investments to our users. So some of our users come, you know, really excited. They're, they got a retirement account. They're looking for tax advantage strategies to build a net retirement account that they can't access at their traditional stockbroker. So these webinars are to, you know, help educate on the space, um, really make you aware of some different asset classes, and also hit some, you know, current topics that are hitting us today. So, you know, we have a very fun, but aptly named for the Times, Cockroach Portfolio, uh, Mutiny Funds here today. Um, Jason, why don't you take it away? Sure. Thanks, Brendan. So we're obviously huge fans of self-directed IRAs. So we love what you guys are doing at Rocket Dollar. And we appreciate not only this opportunity to, to talk to your clients, but we appreciate all your time. Nick, we're going to talk about assets here and, and time is our most important asset. So we appreciate it. Also to kick things off, I always have to give, you know, our disclaimer that nothing I say is an investment advice, you know, seek out your own investment professional and all this is for entertainment purposes only. Also, our funds are for accredited investors only. Um, and so part of that is that we can't necessarily talk about uh, numbers uh, on, on this presentation today, but you can reach out to us at mutinyfund.com, um, fill out our forms, and we're, we're happy to share performance and, and talk to you further. Um, to start off, you know, we have a unique name with Mutiny Funds and then our, our flagship fund, Cockroach. So like every good, you know, pirate epic story, I guess we'll start at the origin. And both my partner that's on this call, Taylor Pearson and I, we're both uh, entrepreneurs. And so if we go back to the pre the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, I was running a commercial real estate development firm. And what I learned is it didn't matter how good I was as an entrepreneur, especially if you're doing you know, something like commercial real estate or any sort of business, a lot of times you have to look far into the future, right? You're, you're making plans now that may pay off two to five years hence. And so therefore you need a, a low volatility environment to make sure you hit your projections. And when we came into 2007 and 2008, when that global liquidity dried up um, and everything went down together, it didn't matter how good you were idiosyncratically as an entrepreneur, you got crushed by the world around you. And it was that immense pain that I felt um, from that 2000, 2007, 2008 experience, you know, what it's like to lose money for family and friends and what happens when global liquidity dried up. That, that pain was the impetus uh, for what we eventually became mutiny funds in our, in our cockroach strategy. So the, the idea was, you know, there's got to be a way to hedge entrepreneurial risk. You know, if I need a low volatility environment going into the future to make sure I hit my projections on my, on my business, you know, pro forma, I got to make sure that I can hedge out some of my volatility risk. So that's a lot harder than people would think. And so, you know, specialized in options and, and VIX strategies. And then, you know, over the decades, start tracking all the other managers in the space as, as I learned, you know, how to potentially hedge those opportunities. And, you know, eventually Taylor and I got together in 2018, 2019, and we were both focused on, you know, allocating to long volatility strategies as part of our total portfolio solution. And we wanted that, that hedge in place that can manage those tail risks. But what Taylor and I found as entrepreneurs is, you know, we had a lot of family and friends that would read books by Nassim Taleb or Chris Cole White Paper or other, you know, luminaries in our space. And they would ask, they would come to us and be, how can I hedge my risk? And we're like, do you have a hundred million dollars plus? And then no, well, you're screwed. There just wasn't opportunities for retail investors to have access to these sophisticated strategies. So what we determined was there's got to be a way to figure that out. So we spent uh, the last few years trying to figure out how we could provide uh, retail access to these sophisticated long volatility, tail risk, and potentially commodity trend strategies. And more importantly, once we were able to build that as a, a cornerstone piece to a portfolio, then we can add in all of these other asset classes to create a total portfolio solution that has stocks, bonds, long volatility, tail risk, commodity trend, gold, and a little cryptocurrencies. And that would be a total portfolio solution that would really be a robust solution for most retail investors. So that was the impetus of where we created our long volatility fund. And eventually we you know, launched our cockroach fund. So I'm going to share my screen real quickly here. So this is the impetus for Cockroach Fund. And the idea is, you know, I told you the background, but also we feel that the investment industry is kind of lied to you. You know, they've been calling your savings investments. And, you know, savings is our hard-earned savings is what's left over after production and then consumption, whatever we have left over savings. And we need those savings to be there when we need them most. And the idea of the investment industry calling them investments it is it forces you to take imprudent risks with your savings. 
Now, they've also recommended this 60-40 portfolio, but we've had this very unique time set over the last few decades where 60-40 portfolios have thrived. Now, the question is, is that going to happen going into the future, right? Are you willing to bet your savings on it or even your, your grandchildren's savings? It's been the largest bull run in investing history for a portfolio that has 60-40 as the primary uh, investment focus. And we'll touch on maybe some of the points that may be changing those factors. Um, the point, point to savings too, is you never know when you're gonna need them most, right? You never know if you're gonna need them this year, 10 years from now, or 50 years from now. And that's, so you need your savings to be in a robust uh, portfolio construction. So you can never know when you're gonna need it into the future. And then you need to be able to tap that savings when you need it most. The only way to really do this prudently is to have proper portfolio diversification that can handle kind of any macro environment we find ourselves in. And it can hopefully have your savings outpace inflation over the long term. So most portfolios, they require you know, offensive and defensive assets. Most provide, portfolios provide offensive assets, but we try to really focus on the defensive side of that portfolio. Because as they say, you know, offense, offense can win games, but defense wins championships. So if we look at a, a long history of the stock index, and this is a, a price index going back to 1920, you'll have long periods where the stock index is underwater. Uh, why do we bring this up? This is what we call sequencing risk, or sometimes you maybe modernly heard it as ergodicity. And the idea is you look at this chart and you go, well, it's up and to the right. But what we're not uh, accounting for is actually your lifespan. And how does your lifespan fit over you know, charts like this? You know, if we have another 25 year period where stocks are underwater, you know, what, ha what if that happens during your prime earning years or during your retirement years? Or what if we're deeply underwater if you have a loved one that has um, you know, some sort of medical emergency that you need to pay for? That's the whole point of sequencing risk. Your individual lifespan may not overlay the overall stock return for the broad exposure of people over you know, a century cycle. When most people recommend you know, a, a broad diversification when you're talking to a, a financial professional, they're gonna show you this pie chart. And they'll show you a whole pie chart of diversification, but what we believe is they're really just showing just half of that chart. They're just showing you offense only investments that really do well during a long, you know, your long GDP, you're hoping the good times keep rolling. And so part of those offensive assets are stocks, bonds, real estate, private equity, and venture capital. But like, as we said, we only believe that's half of the pie chart and you really need to pair those offensive assets with defensive assets. And we talk about defensive assets. We have long volatility, tail risk, commodity trend, gold, and even cryptocurrencies. And we'll get into what each of those means to us. So when we think about proper diversification, you have a four quadrant model of growth, decline, inflation, and deflation. So the four quadrant models are on that axis of growth and inflation. And depending on what environment we're in, you need assets that can ride through any of those four quadrant models. And so when I, I referenced the 60-40 portfolio, maybe the, the big flaw in there over the last few decades, is it's been on the entirely on the left side of this chart. For growth, you've had stocks, and for a deflation or disinflationary environment, you've had bonds. And they paired well, and they've been negatively correlated, so it's been a great strategy over the last few decades. And how long will that run on? We have no idea. We can't time that market specifically. But the point is, they've been negatively correlated. And if you look at a long history of correlations between stocks and bonds, most of the time, they're actually uh, correlated. And usually that happens during inflationary times, but can happen throughout you know, a long history of 100, 120 years. Most of the time, stocks and bonds have been correlated. We've just lived through this negative correlation between them for the last you know, three to four decades. Um, let me see, my screen is, there we go. So if we think about this you know, proper, prudent, uh, robust portfolio diversification of having different asset classes, it goes all the way back to the Talmud. When you had a third each in you know, real estate, cash, and businesses, and so it has a long history of proper prudent portfolio diversification, but we really feel the seminal work was done in the 1970s by Harry Brown and his four quadrant model. He's the one that whenever you see the four quadrant model now, it comes from Harry Brown. And the idea was he had equal parts of stocks, bonds, gold, and cash, and try to, to manage throughout those four quadrants uh, with any macro environment that came along. He used you know, stocks for growth, uh, bonds for deflation, you know, gold for inflation and, and, and cash for a recession. And that's, that's how he structured his portfolio. And then, you know, came along again with Ray Dalio Bridgewater fame. If you look at his all weather strategy, it's almost exactly similar to Harry Brown's four quadrant model. He just leveraged up the bond side of that portfolio. More modern interpretations are Med Faber's Trinity and the great um, paper that Chris Cole wrote on his dragon portfolio is a phenomenal paper if you haven't read it. Uh, but when we think about, you know, these are the four quadrant models, the way we think about them. 
And on, on the top left quadrant there, you're going to have for growth, you have stocks, right? And we all know that. And then what offsets that growth, if we go into a recession or a drawdown in the stocks, is we use volatility. And we're going to dive into the way we think about volatility to offset that risk of stocks. Um, for inflationary times, we use trend or commodity trend managers. And what we're trying to do is ride those waves of commodity prices increase during an inflationary environment. And then for deflation or disinflationary environments, we, use, we call it income, which is bond or bond-like instruments. And these are the way we try to manage the four quadrant model. So we are technically a fund of funds. And what that means is we try to uh, find sub-managers that do very niche strategies to fit within our four quadrant model. So that way we can have robust diversification in an ensemble approach of attacking each one of those quadrants to make sure we build a much more robust portfolio moving forward where we're trying to really manage that drawdown risk. Because anytime you have a massive drawdown, that's a volatility tax on your portfolio and it really affects your compounding. So not only do we have our four quadrants, but we also carved off a little bit of uh, gold and cryptocurrency, which we hold as a hedge to massive fiat devaluation. You know, that can happen due to war, confiscation, you know, mass exodus. And if we're really trying to manage our portfolio over multiple generations or multi-decade uh, time horizons, we want to make sure we have some of those in case there is some sort of massive fiat devaluation. You have a little bit of those fiat hedges on the book to make sure you can manage through those and, and, and not lose the entirety of your portfolio. So let's dive into this a little bit. On the stock side, we looked at a blend of stock indices. So we're using, you know, U.S. stock, uh, developed economies around the world and also emerging economies, um, very similar to MSCI's ACWI, um, and really having that broad diversification across global stocks. On the income side, like I said, is bond or bond-like replacement. So once again, we're using, you know, not only domestic bonds, but we're using global bonds as well. We also pair that with a, a corporate bond strategy where we use Verdad for that. And the idea around that is we're trying to um, time, you know, the, the angels moving from, you know, B bonds into the A space. The other one we use is an ensemble carry strategy, and we're looking for different forms of carry across commodities, interest rates, and, and almost all asset classes. But the idea is you want income for a, a deflationary or disinflationary environment. The trend portfolio is how we ballast against, you know, those times when, you know, inflation starts kicking up. You know, inflation is very pernicious. It's very hard to manage against. So you want to hopefully, you know, different parts of your portfolio can hopefully do their best to capture inflation and maintain your purchase power parity, especially if we're in like a, a 70 style like stagflationary environment. Um, when we think about trend and our broad diversification of trend, we first start uh, with our look backs. So when you're, when you're talking to CTA trend managers or commodity trend managers, there's a wide dispersion of returns in any given year. We believe that's primarily due to the look back periods. Some have very short term look back, some medium, some long term, and that affects how their returns are going to uh, transpire. So, for example, in a, a 2008 like scenario, long term managers did really well in the commodity trend space. And then in March of 2020, short term managers did very well and, and long term managers didn't do so well. So it's about the dispersion of the returns. So we split that bucket into short, medium and long term look backs. And then even within those look backs, we look for managers that have different um, styles of trading, whether they're using moving average breakouts or just price breakouts and different monetization heuristics. Once again, trying to fill out that ensemble approach. So we have a very robust return from that trend profile that reduces the drawdown and wholly, hopefully captures most of the beta signal return from that portfolio. Um, and then our bread and butter is our volatility portfolio. And the idea is that volatility can really offset those stocks. And that's kind of the point. Um, but we have a broad diversification in our, our volatility portfolio across 14 different managers. Um, the bulk of our portfolio is just buying options. Um, we use long vol options. And what that means is our managers are opportunistically buying puts and calls looking for a volatility expansion. Um, we also use volatility arbitrage. It's more of a pairs trade between, let's say, the VIX and the S&P. And hopefully that pairs trade helps pay for a little bit of that premium we're spending, you know, buying that insurance on the option side. We also use um, short-term uh, index futures, and they're trading intraday, intraday on those uh, delta instruments of uh, delta one instruments of, of index futures. And the idea is there; it's a totally different marketplace. They don't have to pay up for that implied volatility. Our options have to pay for, and it's a very uh, unique blend in that sense. By combining those kind of three different buckets, trading across VIX options and futures space, is we felt we could add back in those those deterministic rolling puts that a classical tail risk strategy would have. And so we use this negative 20% attachment point to the S&P where we're constantly rolling puts to make sure we have that protection on. The reason we do that is because Taylor and I want to sleep at night. And the idea is if all of these managers are opportunistically trading the markets, what if there is an exogenous event like a 9-11 happened on a Saturday or Sunday when markets aren't open? 
and our managers didn't, weren't positioned for it. So we permanently have these rolling puts on just to make sure if the market sells off and when it reopens on, on a Monday or the, technically Sunday night, you know, we have those positions on so that we can sleep at night. So that's the broad diversification we provide in the volatility portfolio. And the idea with all this is we use ensemble approaches and we use this four quadrant model because we're trying to build the, ro the best, most robust strategy for, for your savings. And the idea is we're trying to just be drawdown managers. We're trying to reduce that drawdown um, no matter what macro environment we're in, because by reducing that drawdown, you're reducing the volatility tax. And that allows you to compound your wealth more efficiently and effectively over the long term. And that's all we really care about is we don't know the future. We don't believe anybody can predict the future, but we want to have a portfolio that's set up that can handle any future that's to come. But part of that is when you have prudent, you know, broad diversification, you're always going to have one of these buckets that looks terrible, right? That's the whole point. There's going to be one of these buckets that's in the negative, one of these buckets that you're hearing about on the financial news that, you know, it's in the worst drawdown ever. This is a terrible thing to hold. All your friends and family are going to be like, for example, lately, everybody's about inflation and against bonds. But like the whole point is that's part of proper portfolio diversification. There's going to be a part of that portfolio that's always, it's hurting you to hold part of that, but you never know when you're going to need it most. And then the other piece of the broad portfolio diversification is we're rebalancing frequently. And by doing that, we're able to kind of scale trade these different asset classes. And what I mean by that is it's forcing us to buy low and sell high. So as money moves around the globe between stocks, bonds, commodities, and even volatility, we're able to buy high and sell low and scale into those positions with our, with our monthly rebalancing. The idea be behind this in general is Taylor and I wanted to take us back to you know decades ago before we had all of our investments on a smartphone, et cetera. The idea is you're saving for a rainy day, right? And you need those savings to be there when you need them most. And the entire point of that is to not focus on those savings or what people call investments. The idea is if you have a broad, robust portfolio diversification like this, you can sleep better at night. You're not worried about any sort of news risk when you wake up in the morning. And the point to that is we want people to get back to enjoying their everyday lives, right? We want you to enjoy your hobbies. We want to enjoy what you do for a living. We want to, you to enjoy spending time, quality time with your families and not worrying about managing your savings. And that's hopefully where we're getting to is like, there's no reason to be checking your smartphone eight times a day to see where your portfolio is at. This allows you to go back to enjoying your life on that daily basis. And that's what we look forward to doing best. And I know that's quite a, a mouthful and everything. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to Brendan for any questions. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, if, Hopefully we're the solution for you. If not, we're happy to answer any questions and steer you in the proper direction. Great, we had a, a question from Andrew come in. Um, and I don't think this is, this is fees-based, not performance-based. So just let us know if you can answer this, but what is your sure. structure from the funds of funds entity level? Sure, I think, and, and Taylor might correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we're happy to answer that question, you know, privately if you reach out to us at Mutiny Funds. But obviously, with having a fund-to-fund -fund structure, there it, there's a double layer of fees, right? But in general, we view by by building it the way we did um, that you get what you pay for in this scenario. And and internally, we're trading a lot of the stocks and bonds, so you're basically getting those overlays for free. And then part of it is we're we're using a little bit of implicit leverage that allows us that marginability across the whole portfolio. That's another uh, key benefit to our clients that they wouldn't have access to on their own, which also we feel like helps reduce that fee structure on the back end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think we, we're fine. The fees are one percent management fee and a ten percent incentive fee. So that's the standard um, fund of funds fee structure. I think that we're we're fine to say that we just can't talk about performance. Um, and then yeah, I'll add to Jason's comment. You know, specifically, you know, if you if Jason mentioned sort of the 60-40 stock bond focused portfolio, the, the two components that we think are essential that we're adding here are the volatility and the trend components. And for a number of reasons, you know, we, we looked into every way we could do this in a an ETF structure or some other more traditional lower fee structure. And for a variety of reasons, some regulatory, some others, you just can't do those strategies in um in there so our, our sort of research indicated us that you know using active managers net of all fees was a better solution than more lower fee passive um product so that's that's the direction we went in because we felt that was the best um the best and then especially if you're doing it um if you're doing it through ira after tax then um that's very nice as well you're getting the, the tax benefits there all, all accrue as well 
All right, uh, we, we had another um, question come in. What's the approach and what's the minimum investment? You mentioned wanting to make this available to retail in the future, so I hope that it's reasonable. It's really hard to find a good uh, long volatility option. Yeah, it's, as Taylor just referenced, it's almost impossible to find a long volatility option. We also find it's very difficult to find a commodity trend option. Um, most of the 40 act funds we feel um, kind of tie those managers' hands behind their backs so you don't get their full program. Um, and part of it, their minimums, you know, five to $10 million minimums allow this to not be accessed by, by retail clients. And that was our point with aggregating this up at our fund level. It allows people access to these strategies they never have access before, plus our ensemble approach. Mm -hmm. And so our, like we said, we're, we're unfortunately accredited only. Um, you know, we're always trying to work on that as well and, and find different solutions, but the minimum investment is uh, $100,000 US. Okay. And I'll ask a question that's not in a chat, but I know it might be in people's heads. Um, you know, where are you finding your managers in this funds of funds, you know, from your experience, like how are you really sourcing these managers and making the final decisions? Okay, this is a fund we really want to pull into our fund of funds. Great question. So we, we track dozens of managers across all the different asset classes that we trade. Um, like classically, you know, we're, whether it's uh, in person or at events and conventions, et cetera, like we're always trying to source managers that way. We're also sourcing managers over the internet. We're also searching managers over the relationships we currently have in place. And then this is a shout out to our, our partners at RCM Alternatives. We feel they always had one of the best platforms in the world for sourcing, especially CTAs. And so we've really partnered with them. And so from multiple sources, we're always sourcing those managers. And like I said, we're probably tracking dozens of managers within each of those spaces to think about, you know, if and when we would add them and how they fit, you know, fit into that ensemble approach. The best part of the ensemble approach is it's like a Lego building blocks, right? If we ever need to have supplant a manager and a manager goes out of business, we're always tracking another manager that may do something similar or a different wrinkle that we can always plug and play into there. And part of that too is as our assets under manage, uh, management increase, we actually improve the robustness of our portfolio because we're able to add more diversification and add different wrinkles to that strategy. And so we, we really look forward to growth over time actually helps improve the robustness of that portfolio. Yeah, and I just like to you know make it known to the audience. I don't think we haven't had a fund of funds or kind of like that um, ensemble approach Jason is talking about right now. So you know a lot of our investors might be used to like one real estate fund or one stocks and bonds manager. So just know that you know like you, they're going out and testing, looking at their strategy, seeing okay, we love this strategy, but you know is it quite a fit? Could you technically have that for a couple of years and say okay that we're not feeling this anymore? We have another manager that we want to pull in. It's better here. Right. And, and we're always thinking about at that portfolio level and that ensemble approach is by combining managers that have slightly different wrinkles, but are within the same asset class. That also helps that rebalancing premium between them as well um, to, to help that you know, diversification and hopefully reduce that signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had uh, so great a bunch of questions rolling in. We'll get to them. But uh, we had a webinar a long time ago that just talked about, you know, sometimes managers are hot. They have a great strategy that's doing amazing. And, you know, over time, things start to slowly after years and years start to lag and lag. This is just talking about the nimblest of a fund like this that can kind of analyze different managers. Okay, so a bunch of questions rolled in. Thank you. Um, can you talk a bit more about how you think the fund will handle an inflation type environment? Sure. So the idea with inflation, like I, I mentioned, it's, it's incredibly pernicious, right? The hard part is you're just trying to maintain your purchase power parity. Everybody, you know, in most other strategies, you want to, you know, exceed the current environment, but that's what makes inflation so difficult. So the idea is you, there's certain equities allegedly that will do well during inflation. So you may be, be able to cover it that way. You know, bonds or income is not technically, you know, unless they can adapt quickly, like maybe a short-term rental strategy might do okay. Um, the idea is gold um, tends to do well, but that's if we look at the really long arc of history, right? If we look at a 2000 year return of gold, it tends to maintain its purchase power parity, whether it was a suit of armor or a bespoke suit on Savile Row. But in intervening years or even decades, gold tends not to necessarily keep up with inflation if you look at it in a more granular level. This is why we believe in our, our trend approach, our commodity trend managers, is they have the highest beta to inflation. The question is, will they capture it, right? And then what's the position sizing the overarching portfolio? And that's the idea that we, we really believe that in the future, if we do see a sustained inflationary environment, you're going to see a lot of more of this commodity trend come back into vogue because you're trading you know, upwards of 60 to 100 different markets and the different commodities, and you're riding the wave of those increase or decreasing commodity prices as they go both long and short across our portfolio. And mm -hmm. we, we specifically look for managers that are carrying more than 40% commodities on their books. So that's our, our best bet on capturing that inflationary move. And like they said, the hardest part is, it, will it capture it? And 
And then, that, like we said, we still have that that gold and cryptocurrencies because we're not sure, you know, how they'll really respond to inflation over the short term. But they are a massive, uh, whether it's a deflationary default or a hyperinflationary environment, you're going to want those gold or cryptocurrencies, and, and we'll see how those play out. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I'll just quickly add to that. I think um, you know, you look people worry about inflation. They add two percent or three percent commodity exposure to a portfolio, and our, our feeling is, you know, you, you, if that's if that's what you're concerned about, and you want to worry about that path dependency. You need some meaningful allocation. So about a quarter of our exposure is in that commodity. So we think, compared to other strategies that are much more commodity light, I think we'll will hold up very well in an inflationary environment. Yeah, we had a webinar a long time ago, right when the inflation kind of was, I'd say the, the rumblings first started, and that was a commodity base. And just, you know, for investors out there, you know, they've long gone to real estate because they think it's a more um, physical type asset that's more realistic in value. When we're looking at public markets, that's what a lot of public market thinkers and investors, that's where they go. They're looking for commodities because more of that attachment to real life value compared to, let's say, um, a high flying startup with a crazy valuation lots of promise, but nothing really tying it to an actual pure value when you get down to the nitty gritty and the tough times. All and right. So Brent, to, to your point too, like with real estate, you know, as I have a background in commercial real estate development is, you know, you're also, uh, you also have to pair in the idea of interest rate rising, right. And mm -hmm. how much that's going to affect you, whether it's cap rate comp uh, compression or expansion. And so it's not just, can you uh, charge more rent, maybe on a shorter term rental cycle, but it's also about what is the cost of the money you're borrowing against. And if we have a rising rate environment to paired with it, a higher inflation environment, you might still be underwater, especially if cap rates start going the other way, which we haven't seen for a few decades now. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. David has a question. He asked, um, all right. If you, uh, Sorry, just let me get a handle on it. If you're going through an active management firm that proposes simply rotating through traditional retail instruments for each macro environment, what would you say is the delta between mutiny and a risk-adjusted basis in general terms since you can't disclose performance versus rotating? All right, so can you see that question, Jason? I just want to make yeah, it- Yeah, I, I can see it, but if, if David, if you don't mind maybe typing some further on the question, because I'll try to answer, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm completely following it. Um, if we're rotating through traditional investments for each macro environment. I, I was sure it's rotating, it's like timing. Is that, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. what you mean, like that you're tilting towards stocks because you think it's stocks versus tilting towards something else. I'm not sure if that's the intent of the question. Try, try and take a quick stab at it, Taylor, and then David. Can. Yeah, go for it. Please. He said yes on your kind of assumption there, Jason. Okay, what was, uh, so the idea is like, if we have traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds, right? Like we feel also we can diversify through those a little bit better over time. But yeah. if you're pairing those with these very active management uh, strategies like long volatility and commodity trend, and the idea is that rebalancing premium is what we talked about earlier, is also what we're able to do is because if you build really robust portfolios and you're reducing that signal to noise ratio and you're reducing that volatility tax, you're actually going to have a lower return, a lower volatility and lower drawdown. So what we do internally, because we're able to build this in futures and options, is we actually uh, increase our leverage a, bit, a little bit across the portfolio in a prudent way when you have broad diversification. And so by having all these internally and rebalancing monthly, one, you're getting that implicit leverage where we can kind of target the return profile we're looking for. But two, that rebalancing effect is the, it provides that rebalancing premium that is much more uh, prudent to really compounding your wealth over the long term. And the idea behind it is by us doing the rebalancing, it's forcing you to rebalance. And like I said, scale trading these asset classes. So it's basically forcing you to buy, uh, buy low and sell high as we, we move between these different you know, macro environments. I hope that kind of touched on it. Or, or Taylor, you might have taken it a different direction. No, I was just saying, I think maybe one of the things that is different about our approach is we just don't believe we have any ability to time these sorts of macro shifts, right? So, um, and Jason describes it, you know, you have these, these sorts of air pockets that happen in the markets, right? You have these phase shifts. So, you know, March 2020 is probably the most recent memorable example, but, um, you know, you, you hear these, you Bill Ackman, you hear these stories of people that do very well, but there's no one that's been consistently able to predict these sort of macro events um, and sort of when things shift. So, it, you know, when you're doing some sort of timing thing, you're like, oh, I think stocks are going to do here. I think inflation is going to be higher here. You know, you're implicitly saying, I think I have some ability to predict this greater than whatever the rest of the market is doing. Um, and we, we don't think we have that ability. We don't think anyone has that ability. And so by having equal exposure across all four macro quadrants, as Jason said, 
Um, whichever quadrant is doing well, we're taking gains out of that quadrant and we're rebalancing into the other, the, the other pieces so that whenever things change, um, things turn around, right? So if you, you know, you're rebalancing running this type of approach going into, um, you know, March, 2020, uh, you've been sort of like, you know, reload as volatility has declined, you've been reloading on that. Suddenly, you know, you'd expect volatility to do well in a March, 2020 type environment. And then what happens? You're taking some of those gains and you're redistributing them back to equities or other things that maybe got hit. So that, that sort of key is we, we don't believe we have any sort of predictive ability and we don't believe anyone, um, anyone else does either. And, and that also might, it actually ties in another question that was in the, the Q&A about, are you considering providing just the less popular pieces like the volatility strategy separately with the idea that an investor that already has equity bond exposure and other vehicles? And yes, we actually, we, you know, we're talking about our cockroach right now. Um, and, and Taylor kind of highlighted why we believe that total package for us to rebalance is a much better solution for people. But we actually do offer the individual sleeves. You can get access to just our long volatility fund. You can get access to just our commodity trend fund. We just feel it's a, it's a better overall portfolio if we're handling the rebalancing in-house. And one of the reasons just to get uh, dive into the weeds maybe a little too much is you know, we offer monthly liquidity with our strategies, but what that means in practice is we ask you 10 days before the end of the month to ask for your redemption. And then the third party administrator may take several weeks into the next month before they, they're sending that wire out. So it makes it a little bit more difficult, even though we're providing that monthly liquidity, it may be a little bit more difficult for you to attenuate the rebalancing yourself in a very granular manner, but it is possible. And we have, we have plenty of people that use those individual sleeves and they might set it up on like a quarterly rebalancing cycle. All right, great, thank you. Um, so there, there was kind of two questions that are related. Um, you know, how long has your company been operating, and how many employees are at uh, Mutiny Funds? Sure. So, um, like I said, Taylor and I got together end of 2018. Um, it took us all of 2019 to really put this together with the lawyers and get over the regulatory burden. So even though we're technically in business in 2019, it was really, uh, really getting the the funds up and running to be able to provide access. And then we actually launched our long volatility piece on April 17th of 2020. Obviously we would have preferred to be launched in Q1, you know, January, 2020 would have been great for us, but we'll take uh, launching our fund. Um, Cause once again, we have to aggregate up enough to um, allocate to our sub managers. So long volatility launched April 17th of 2020. And then we just launched our cockroach fund, which we're very proud of on September 1st of 2021. Great. And, oh, and then I'm um, sorry, employees. Um, so at the fund, um, at, the, at a high level, it's Taylor and I, and uh, we have our assistant Melanie in, in South Africa. But then we were also smart as entrepreneurs. We, we joint ventured uh, this project for RCM Alternatives out of Chicago that runs billions of dollars across their, their six pillars of investment. And there's a team of, of dozens behind them. So it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a robust team structure. But once again, almost like our ensemble modular approach, we use the same thing with our business as well. Great. Um... All right. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free, any audience members, to throw out any more questions that you have. And quickly, just repeat, I know we talked about the very beginning, but to remind people, how long have you two been in the business, just to remind all of our listeners, doing these different types of strategies? Sure. So like I said, we're, we're both entrepreneurs um, at heart. Um, I've been trading my own uh, options book for a better part of two decades. Um, and then I've been trading uh, VIX relative value strategies, kind of stumbled on those myself in 2011, trying to trade the intermarket spread between um, SPY and VIX. So, you know, we got that uh, kind of history of doing it ourselves. So that way we know exactly what the pitfalls to look out for. Um, and then, like I said, been in this, this side of running a fund of funds business since like 2019 of getting over, you know, getting the regulatory uh, paperwork done. And then uh, Taylor can talk a little bit more about his entrepreneurial background as well. Oh, you're muted, Taylor. I'm mute, Taylor. Caught it. Um, my background primarily is um, fintech and um, financial technology and got sort of into the industry um, through that way. So I handle a lot of our back office stuff and automating all our processes and making sure everything um, runs smoothly. And then one, one of the nice things about a the fund to fund structure is um, our managers are the ones that we let be the real smart people that have 30 years of experience and have been doing this a long time. So we're, we're very fortunate you know, across all our managers. We have, um, you know, 200 employees. We had you know, dozens of research, all these people that are always actively working on making these strategies better. So we lean on them heavily. Yeah. I just want to highlight what Taylor said too, is like, you know, like uh, what was referenced in one of the earlier questions is like, there's not a lot of retail access to long volatility or Taylor strategies. Um, and part of that one, we wanted to offer that access. 
but um, two part of that is the we feel like one of the last bastions of active management, right? Anybody can just hit a button and buy and sell stocks and bonds, but long volatility uh, is a very difficult uh, game to play, and because the volatility surfaces are constantly undulating. So, like Taylor said, we're piggybacking uh, across our sub managers as they are the ones hiring teams of quants. Um, and all the operational infrastructure and everything. So we're able to kind of lean on that. So there's a, um, you know, almost a, a cascade from Taylor and I at the top to, you know, our back office with RCM alternatives to our individual sub managers and their teams of, of quants and traders that they're all working on. So it's like multiple layers of robustness, which obviously, you know, piles right into our theme of building very robust portfolios. Great, thank you so much. Um... So um, I'm just going to give a few quick updates about Rocket Dollar, and then we're going to close out here for today. Thanks so much, Jason and Taylor, for coming in and speaking today. Um, we're going to have a discount code of $50 for anyone with mutiny funds. If you're still looking for a Rocket Dollar account, you can feel free to use that. That'll give $50 off. Um, you know, we've long been known for our IRA LLC and our check, you know, commonly called checkbook IRAs. Um, we're going to be pushing a massive update very soon. You'll see some more of that um, in the Rocket Dollar newsletters popping out. We're also doing a really great update to our direct custody IRA that's going to be coming very soon. So hopefully you can all stay in touch with that. We'd love if you join us here at Rocket Dollar, check out a self-directed IRA, and kind of access some of these advanced strategies that are really tough to get at a traditional stockbroker. Sometimes it's not impossible to get a strategy with all this um, volatility and these safeguards in place. Um, so thank you so much, Jason and Taylor, for stopping by today. Thanks for the opportunity, and we really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you all. All right, thank you.